God makes rage. Fights about God are frequent and fierce. Does God exist? What is God's name? Who are God's people? To me, to ask questions about God without describing God, or at least defining God, seems aimless or meaningless. So what can we know about God? What is God like? The easy answer is nothing. God is not like anything. But if that's supposed to be good enough, that's just not good enough. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out what is God like? I begin in Notre Dame to meet Alvin Plantinga, a leading Christian philosopher who has energized intellectual believers. After a half century of thinking about God, a lifetime of worshiping God, how does Al describe God? One thing to bear in mind to start off with is that the concept of God is uh, deeply embedded in the human psyche. So the vast majority of the world's population now and over history believes that there is such a person as God. So it's not like a sort of made up idea. It's a part of our spiritual and cognitive nature to think about God. And the basic idea is that God is a being who is worthy of worship, who deserves our worship, our obedience and is such that we should we should be on his side. And then if you tease out well, now what's involved in God's being uh, worthy of worship, well, the basic idea is that God has to be very, very powerful. And in fact, God has to be thought of as he who has created the universe and hence also very, very knowledgeable. God has to be thought of as, if not all knowing, at least knowing a very great deal. And if God is really worthy of worship, God is also perfectly good, a God of love, one who never does anything out of spite or out of carelessness or out of hate or envy. So you, you quite quickly can go from the notion of this being who is worthy of worship to the classical Judaistic Christian Islamic conception of what God is like. How, how can we begin to think about God having a nature? If God has a nature, then there are certain things that he can't do. He can't, so to speak, go against his nature. If it's part of God's nature to be omnipotent or omniscient, all-knowing, let's say, then it can't be that he should decide not to be omniscient <laughs> and say, well, I'd rather just not know anything or not know very much. It's terribly wearing to have to know all these things and so on. So one, one way to think about this is whether God really does have a nature. One reason for thinking God doesn't have a nature is the, the idea that God really has to be sovereign. He has to be independent of everything else. He has to be in total control. So then you're going to begin to categorize a series of things that God can't do or is limiting God. So I would say that God does have a nature it's of importance and interest to, to see what this nature consists in, what God really is like. So God would not just, as a matter of fact, be all-powerful, but would have been all-powerful no matter how anything else had turned out. Couldn't have failed to be all-powerful. Couldn't have failed to be omniscient, all-knowing. Couldn't have failed to be a God of love. Couldn't have failed to be perfectly good. So we would have these properties and have them essentially, you might say, or have them necessarily. It's important to think about God's being a perfect being or God's being a being worthy of worship, somebody who is such that it makes sense, is right to worship. I guess I think of such a being would have to be a best possible being or a greatest possible being. 
one such that there couldn't be any being greater than it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's how I'm inclined to think of God. So if is there that are, sufficiently strong? Well, if there are to Al, worship comes first. And then from worship, all God's characteristics follow. But if worship is anything organized, I don't much relate. Maybe there's something wrong with me, but I see God without traditional worship. So how to discern God without starting with worship? Happily, Peter Van Inwagen is also at Notre Dame. Peter believes in God as well. He's a tough-minded philosopher who won't lean on the weak read of soft arguments. Where does Peter begin to frame God? Peter, in trying to discern whether I believe God exists, I can't ask that question in the abstract without really understanding what is this being that I am asked to believe in. So I ask you as a, both a philosopher and a philosopher of religion to articulate some of the characteristics of God traditionally or as you see them. And this is very much a philosopher's and theologian's list to describe the greatest possible being, that that's really the idea. God is not only greater than every other being, there could not be a being greater than God or even another being equally great. And if there were such a being, what would this being be like? Well, theists at any rate believe that the greatest possible being would be a person. That is somebody who can be addressed, somebody that you can make requests to uh, and who will listen to those requests or say things back to you when you say things uh, to him. Uh, in other words, God is not some impersonal thing like the dialectic of history or the Neoplatonic one or the force. Uh -huh. Secondly, God is, in the traditional list, omnipotent. That is, there's absolutely nothing he can't do. The only time you can say God can't do something would be if it were something that was intrinsically impossible in the very strong sense of being self-contradictory. Well, all right, we'll admit, even God can't make it both rain and not rain at the same place at the same time. Even God can't draw around square. Even God, some say, can't change the past. But he can do anything if his doing that thing would be logically possible. He knows everything, too. That's called omniscience. There is nothing that escapes his knowledge. At least that's one statement. Thirdly, uh, we can say that he's absolutely morally perfect. He could never possibly do anything wrong. If you think that God did something wrong, either you've made a mistake and God didn't do that thing, or else it wasn't wrong for him to do it. And I think all these are absolutely non-negotiable. This God is eternal. He never began to exist. He never will exist. He depends for nothing else for his existence. In fact, he has to exist in the same strong sense as the sense in which two and two have to equal four. Sometimes philosophers or theologians put that by saying he's a necessary being. Now that doesn't mean he's necessary for something. It means that his existence is absolutely inevitable. He would have existed no matter what. Everything else there is depends for God on its existence. His creation of the world doesn't mean that he brings the world into existence and then lets it go on and can watch it going on uh, by its own power. Now he has to keep sustaining it in existence second after second. If he didn't, it would immediately vanish all in an instant. Furthermore, he's the only possible being that could have any of these powers. If we think in terms of possible worlds, he exists in every possible world and in no other possible world is there any being uh, who lacks any of these features. He lacks them in no possible world. This is, I think, a fair attempt at describing those features that the human intellect can grasp that would belong to the greatest possible being. Peter begins with the notion that God is perfect, and from God's perfection, he has all else follow. But 
perfect being theology, as this quest is called, seems more like an intellectual beauty contest than a guide to God. Perfection may seem pure and absolute, but I fear that for finite human minds, perfection may be a friend whose faults. How about the Jewish view of God with all the strivings and strugglings between God and people? I seek out Rabbi Neil Gilman, professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. His views I've heard have many layers. Everything we say about God emerges out of the human experience. In my more heretical moments, I believe that when uh, my ancestors talked about God, they looked in the mirror. Because there's this humanization of God. Uh, this biblical God who is so vulnerable, who's so filled with feelings, who changes his mind back and forth in the book of Jonah. He sends the prophet, the only successful prophet we have. And Jonah convinces the people of Nineveh to repent and to change. And God sees that they have changed their behavior and God changes his mind about punishing Nineveh. And Jonah is furious. <laughs> he doesn't understand that his role is not to, to prophesy an inevitable future, but a conditional future that God sits around in heaven and waits for us to change. And when we change, then God changes God's plans for creation. And, and, and Jonah screams and says, that's exactly why I ran away from you, God, because I knew that you're the kind of God who changes his mind. Uh, and I'm left looking like a fool because I said the city's going to be destroyed and it's not. So God says, apparently, I have to teach you uh, a lesson about what God is all about. And he teaches him a lesson of, of compassion. So the whole notion of the changeability of God is tied to God's feelings, but it's also very much tied to how our ancestors developed uh, an understanding of God, a picture of God. Philosophers would use the concept of metaphor that God appears like he's, he's changing because that's the way he has to speak to human beings. That's the only way God can speak to human beings, but in truth, God in, in his self is, is impassable, Robert, doesn't change. What do we know about God in his self? That's why I'm here to talking to you. I, I don't know anything more than you do. <laughs> it's not a heresy today to say that we talk about God in, in human terms. The Torah uses human language. They refuse to anesthetize God. They humanize God. And they projected a God who is sometimes demonic in his exercise of his power. Uh, sometimes God does terribly cruel things, uh, but who is also vulnerable, able to be hurt, feeling angry, yearning, upset, disappointed. And this kind of God, the God who has all those feelings and can change, is a more it's a stronger God, is a richer God than one who would be passive. Infinitely richer, because this is a God I can identify with, and this is a God I can approach and have, you know, to use a, a contemporary poet, I can roll up our sleeves, sit down across the kitchen <laughs> table, and share a shot of scotch <laughs> and say, okay, let's talk it through. <laughs> the Hasidic masters, you know, did this all the time. They challenged God about God's sins. You know, there's this famous exchange about, about a Hasidic master who said to God before the high holidays, you know, I'll forgive you about your sins if you forgive us <laughs> our sins, right? And then we'll begin with a clean slate. And what emerged out of the pages of the Bible is this incredibly humanized God uh, who is a God who speaks to human feelings it's not a philosophical God. It's very much of a living, vivid, breathing, sweating, living kind of God. Uh, and this is a God that I feel much more at home with. Neil's God, the God of the Hebrew scriptures, seems rather human, perhaps all too human. No grand perfections, seems to change his mind at times. <laughs>
But does this biblical kind of God contradict the philosopher's perfect being kind of God? To find out, I go to Oxford to meet Richard Swinburne, a renowned philosopher of religion. I lay out for Richard, as if for my professor, what I think I am supposed to know about God. I, I find fascinating that you have defined God on, on different levels and some follow from the others. At the deeper levels are more fundamental, and yes. you've defined omnipotence, omniscience, all power, all knowledge, and being perfectly free as the three primary yeah. characters, yeah. like primary colors, yeah. and out of those you derive some of the yeah. others. But I find equally fascinating that below that, where you started, was God as a person. Is that the most fundamental thing? Then you build the omnipotence, the omniscience, and the perfectly free out of that? I'm happy with that description. Uh, what I'm describing is the simplest sort of person there could be. So yes, you start with a person, and then you say, well, a person to create the universe has obviously got to be very powerful and very knowledgeable and very free. He wouldn't be able to create the universe otherwise. So the only issue is, does he have very great but limited power? very many true beliefs, but some false ones, and so on. And it's far simpler to suppose there are zero limits than to suppose there are some large finite limits. To be a person, you have to have powers, beliefs, and uh, a freedom of choice of some sort. Critics of theism try to discourage me when I read their works by claiming that the statements of theism are incoherent they logically contradict or are totally meaningless. Yes. Uh, some of the sentences we utter clearly contain a buried contradiction. Uh, if I were to say that there is a square that has only three sides, that would be a straightforward contradiction because what one means by a square is something with four equal sides and four equal angles. But some statements also contain buried contradictions in which the contradictions are buried quite a long way and it needs a, a lot of uh, argument to draw out that they, they are contradictory. For example, I myself think that there's a contradiction in saying that some uh, cause now could cause an effect yesterday. Uh, other people deny that, but this is an arguable point. Now, the same issues arise with the things that theists say. Theism claims that God is a person, but a person who doesn't have a body. Many critics have come along and said, to say that there is a person is to say that there is someone who occupies a chunk of space and uh, therefore must have a body. So there is an immediate contradiction there. And there's only one way to show that something is coherent, and that is to describe in great detail a supposition and to show that it follows from that supposition that the statement is true. Now, in the case of theism, they question whether person without body is coherent. So the only way I can try to persuade them it is coherent is to describe what this would be like. And I would start by giving a story, not about God, but just about a low-grade spirit who doesn't have a body but is a person. And I would say, well, uh, suppose you find yourself unable to control your body, which you can't make any difference to, but you do find yourself gradually acquiring a different perspective on the world, not looking out from here, but looking out from a position where there is no body. And you find that you can make a difference to things there, but not a difference to things here. And I describe in more and more detail the experiences you would have and what would happen in the room and what you could make a difference to, even though there was no chunk of matter corresponding to your body. And in that way, I would be gradually making sense of showing you that it was a coherent supposition that there is a bodiless person. Religion makes a claim about how things are. If the claim is incoherent, it must be false. But of course, theism can be stated somewhat inaccurately, somewhat loosely, so as to uh, contain these apparent well, contradictions, and it's the job of the philosopher to state it very carefully so that there aren't any contradictions involved, and I think that can be done.
Richard's famous claim is that God's characteristics are coherent. That if one defines and dissects God's attributes carefully, no contradictions arise. But even assuming that such a God is coherent, it only means that such a God is not instantly impossible. As for whether such a God really exists, coherence by itself provides scant support. Am I too confined within Judeo-Christian tradition? Should I try to break free? No one is more familiar with diverse religions than Houston Smith, who has practiced Buddhism, Hinduism, and Sufism, a form of Islam, all the while, he says, remaining a lifelong Christian. How can that be? How can Houston hope to harmonize what are often warring beliefs about God? Houston, many people talk about God, but nobody really talks about what is God like in his own self. How can we begin to approach this question, what is God like? We have to have our own technical language, just like mathematics uh. and equation, and that technical language is symbolism mm. and metaphor mm. and, by extension, art. Mm. Using that approach, we can say that all of the eight authentic religions that have shaped civilization, they all make a distinction between the esoteric and the exoteric. Esoteric is the essence, the inner, uh, like the kernel of the walnut, and exoteric is the shell that protects mm. the uh, esoteric. Now, the outer exoteric, one uses language and metaphor, uh, God is loving, kind, and uh, all the rest. All of them say their phases into a stage where words drop out of view, mm. and one has to just intuit uh, from the runways uh, that the uh, thoughts are taking off from. It's more like seeing than like thinking. Mm. We can take all of the virtues we can think of and we can carry them as far as our th words and our ideas. They're reliable pointers, but they never themselves deliver <laughs> what they are pointing at is like. So what can we know about God? What is God like? If there is a God, that God must have traits. But if those traits are not coherent, if working together they do not make sense, then one should properly doubt that such a God exists. Where to start? God is a being who is with the human proclivity to worship, our worship. God is not only with God's a perfection, what I'm describing is the with God as a person, this with a biblical God, 
who changes? With what God is not? With an ineffable, esoteric being. All claim to be the way most fundamental. But which is best? Does it even matter? If God exists, starting with God's traits is closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.